Good morning, kids, and welcome back to a, another children's church episode. Oh, wow, look at this plane. This thing is massive. Can you tell how big that plane is? There's like an army base right off the side here. It's huge. And look at this sunken boat. Pretty funny. Wow, we didn't make it like, what, 10 seconds without a distraction? That's not a good sign. But again, welcome to Children's Church, the virtual edition. And today we are going to be exploring a holiday that you might not be very familiar with. So hopefully you're ready for an adventure, ready to learn something new. I will be your guide, so come along and follow me on the adventure. So last week, we celebrated a holiday at church called Pentecost, which might be a different holiday than some of you have heard of before. So real quick, can we just learn how to say that together? So there's like three parts to the word. There's pen, like, you know, the writing utensil, writing with the pen. Then you have the T sound, T. And then at the end, you say cost. Like if you went to a store and you asked, how much does this stuffed animal cost or something like that? So pen, T cost. Think you can say that with me? Pentecost. Now Pentecost is a holiday that has everything to do with Jesus, but it's actually a holiday that started long before Jesus came to the earth. And let's find out what that's all about right now. In order to understand Pentecost, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Like the very, very beginning. The very, very beginning. So we have creation, right? God creates the whole earth. And then he creates two people. Remember their names? Adam and Eve, that's correct. So he creates Adam and Eve and everything's good and perfect and happy. But then Adam and Eve sin. They choose to do the wrong thing. And next thing you know, everything gets messed up and we have sickness and sadness and mean people and all this bad stuff. All right, so later on, a man named Abraham comes along and God says to Abraham, your family is going to be my people and your family is gonna grow into this great nation and through your family, I am going to bless everybody in the whole world and I am going to restore everything back to what it was supposed to be like in the Garden of Eden when there was no sin and everything was perfect. And then we fast forward a little bit and we get to the story of Joseph, which we just talked about, right? And Joseph, he ends up saving a bunch of people with all this different stuff in his life. But then at the end of his life, do you remember where his family, who were the Israelites, where did they end up living? They moved somewhere. Was it to Israel or Egypt or America? Well, if you answered Egypt, you were correct. They ended up all living in Egypt and everything was great there and God saved them because of it and all was happy. But then things turned for the worst and the Egyptians decided that they didn't like the Israelites. And next thing you know, all the Israelites became slaves in Egypt. And then you see Moses, he comes along the, on the scene and God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, don't let my people go. And they go back and forth and the plagues and all that kind of stuff. And eventually Israel is freed from Egypt. They get out of Egypt. They are no longer slaves. And that is where Pentecost starts to take place. Now that the Israelites were freed from slavery and they had left Egypt, they needed a guide as to how it was that they were supposed to live their lives. They needed some sort of a rule book to tell them what things they should do and what things they shouldn't do. So God gave it to them. God tells Moses that he is going to meet him on Mount Sinai and there he is going to give Israel his rule book for their lives. So this is what happens. Exodus 19, I'm starting at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. They were shaking in fear. They were scared to death. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. 
and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. When God appears to Moses, he appears with power, right? We have this huge thunderstorm happening on Mount Sinai and the loud trumpet blast, and then God descends on the mountain in fire. Fire! Kind of reminds me of the other time that we saw God appear to Moses. If you remember the story of Moses, um, he's out one day with his sheep and stuff, and all of a sudden there's this bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up, and then it starts talking to him, and it's like God appeared to him in this way. So we see God appear again in fire, and it is made very clear that God shows he is powerful. He is someone to be feared. He's perfect. But in the case of the Israelites, He's also on their side. I mean, he's the one that's been fighting for them and leading them and got them out of slavery from, from Egypt and all that great stuff. But now the time had come for Moses to hear what it was that God expected of his people. What was his guide book or his rule book for them? It's one that we live by even today. God gives Moses and the Israelites 10 commands. Uh, think of it kind of like 10 super important rules. Um, so some of them are the fact that they aren't supposed to worship any other fake gods, only worship the one true God. Um, he tells them to not lie and not steal, don't murder, um, don't be jealous when someone else has something that you don't have. Um, he tells them to honor their father and mother, honor their parents, um, all these different things. And so Moses gets them, he gives them to the people, and he tells the people that this is what it is that we're supposed to do. This is our rule book to live our lives. And so Pentecost, that's right, we're talking about Pentecost here. Pentecost was a holiday to celebrate this day when God visited Moses and Israel and he gave them the Ten Commandments. Every year, Jews gather together for Pentecost to remember the day when God showed up on Mount Sinai and gave Israel the Ten Commandments and really the whole law. And when they would gather, they would not only remember the Ten Commandments, but they would also be reminded with the fact that they hadn't always kept the Ten Commandments, right? We all mess up and make mistakes. We all sin. We might have not honored our mom and dad, not obeyed them. We might not have always told the truth, or maybe we cheated on a test and took somebody else's answer or something like that, right? All these things, we've all messed up and we've all failed in some way. And so when the people would gather for Pentecost, they would be reminded of that too. Now, the Pentecost that we celebrate at church is not just the celebration of the law, but a very special Pentecost that happened the year that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. As a matter of fact, it happened just 10 days after Jesus went up into heaven. So uh, let's find out what crazy thing happened that day to make it a Pentecost that no one will ever forget. I'm going to read from the Jesus Storybook Bible to tell you about this very special Pentecost that happened. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in a stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed. The door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus had told them. I am going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So here they were, waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was just being scared and hiding. You can't blame them. Their best friend had left. The important people and leaders were after them, and Jesus had given them a job they didn't know how to do. As they waited, they were praying and remembering, remembering how, from the beginning, God had been working out his secret rescue plan. Suddenly, a strong wind filled the little room, whistling through the walls, rustling the straw on the floor. And there, on everyone's head, shining in the gloom, were flickering flames, fire that didn't hurt or burn. 
and something more. Inside, in their hearts, they felt a strange heat, almost as if all the coldness and hardness were melting away, as if their broken hearts were mending or healing, and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly. How it happened, they didn't know, but they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze, and Jesus himself was coming to live inside them. They had seen Jesus go away, but now he was closer than he had ever been, inside their hearts. And this time, nothing could ever separate them. Jesus would always be there, with them, loving them, whispering the promise that would get rid of the poison and the terrible lie and the sickness in their hearts, God's wonderful promise to them. You are my child, and I love you. Make your home in me as I make my home in you, Jesus had said. Could it be heaven was coming into their hearts? They threw open the shutters. Sunlight flooded their room as love had flooded their hearts. And the little room was filled with happy noises, dancing feet, singing, laughing. They unlocked the door and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice so everyone could hear. Jesus died for you, he said, because he loves you. God made him alive again. He has rescued you. People stopped and listened. The words sank down deep into their hearts and worked like a medicine that makes you well, like the antidote to a deadly poison, like a kiss that wakes you from a deep sleep. Stop running away from God, Peter said. Run to him instead so he can love you and make you free. And Peter told them the wonderful story of God's love. God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. How Jesus had come, all that had happened. There's Peter running to tell everybody this great news. There were lots of people from faraway countries in Jerusalem, right? They were there to celebrate Pentecost. All these different Jews from different places, but they didn't speak the language, same Hebrew language as others. They couldn't speak the same language, but as they listened to Peter, everyone could understand what he was saying in their own languages. But he, like, he didn't even know their languages, but somehow he was speaking to them and they could understand them in their language. Many people believed and became, and became Jesus' new friends and helpers. And the wonderful news of Jesus spread like sparks from a fire to villages, towns, cities, Every day, more and more people believed. And so it was that the family of God's children, his special people, grew. And that is the story of Pentecost. Did you notice the similarities and the differences between the first Pentecost and this Pentecost? So before we saw God descend on that mountain, on Mount Sinai and the big fire and there was the thunder and the whole like um, big storm and whatnot. And this time around, again, we see God descending in fire and there's that rushing wind that comes through and the loud sound so much so that people come out to f find out what in the world is going on. Now, the difference here is that the first time when God came down, he came down on, on Mount Sinai and all of Israel had to stay down at the bottom of the mountain. Only Moses was allowed to go up there and meet God. But this time, God wasn't just coming down to people, but he was coming down to live inside of people. That's right, the Holy Spirit, who is God, just as much as Jesus is God, and there's God the Father, I know Trinity, really difficult to understand, but God himself, he came down to live inside of anybody who was a part of his family. So why is it that he would wanna do that? Why is that important for us? There are two things I wanna focus in on as far as why it is so amazing and important that the Holy Spirit came down in fire and now lives in each one of us that are part of God's family. The first one is something that the Jesus Storybook Bible really did a great job of pointing out. And that is the fact that if we are in God's family, we are never alone. God is always with us and he's not just near us, he's even inside of us. So we don't have to live in fear or in worry 
because we know that the God of the universe loves us, cares for us, and is always with us, closer than anyone or anything else. The second thing that I think God really wants us to see here is that the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us to be our guide, our guide in life, and to be our source of power to follow after God and to love him the way that we're supposed to love him. You know, in that first story with Moses, we saw that God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. And that was a great thing for them to have this rule book, this guide as to how they live, should live their life, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. But the problem with those Ten Commandments is that in our own power, in our own strength, with our own willpower, we end up failing. We don't do the right things and it leaves us feeling guilty and broken because that's really what we are. But this time around, when God sent us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, the Holy Spirit doesn't just help us know what's right, what's wrong, what we should be doing to follow after God. He also gives us the power so that we can actually do it. We can truly follow after God and love him. There's a prophet in the Old Testament named Ezekiel, and he actually prophesied about this. And he said that there would be a day when God would send his spirit to live inside of us and give us a new heart. He would take out that old heart that was just full of hardness, brokenness, maybe um, the bad things and just not following after God. And he would give us a new heart that would be able to truly love God and love others. Now, taking all of this into consideration, remember at the end of the day, when we do mess up and we do fail, because you can have the Holy Spirit inside of you and decide that you're just not gonna listen to him, you're gonna do the wrong thing, that God is still willing to forgive us and be gracious to us, and he says that if we confess those sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us or purify us from all wrongdoing, all the bad things. And that is an amazing promise that we can't forget. But you don't need to live in that always thinking that oh, it's not a big deal that I sin, I, God will forgive me. No, we don't have to live that way because the Holy Spirit is changing us so that we can be better followers of God. And how cool is it that when Peter and those other disciples, when they went out to tell people about Jesus and start preaching to them, um, the Holy Spirit was doing some crazy things for them. Right? There were those, um, all these different people that were in their town to celebrate Pentecost. They had come from different countries because they wanted to follow um, the God of the Jews. But then when they got there, they heard these people that were from like Judea speaking in their own languages, even though those people didn't know their languages, but the Holy Spirit was allowing them to do that. And it's crazy things like that that happen when the Holy Spirit is involved. God makes a way where there was no way. And he allows us to do things that on our own power, we wouldn't be able to do. And of course, when he came, when the Holy Spirit came for this first time to live inside of humans, he wanted to make sure that he was known, that his power was seen. And so when he showed up, he showed up in a big way. In my opinion, even in a bigger way than what God had done earlier on to Moses and those other Israelites in that mountain. Yeah, that thunderstorm and that fire was crazy, but what God was doing here and now, I think was even bigger and crazier. This is why we celebrate Pentecost. We are celebrating the fact that God has sent us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us so that we would never be alone, so that we could be comforted, that we could find peace, that we could find joy, and that we could be changed to be better followers of God. When the Holy Spirit is present, crazy things happen. Like the fact that 3,000 people or more became believers that day because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can use us to tell others the good news about Jesus, and he can work on them so that they might decide to follow God as well. That's all that I have for today, and I do have a request. So I know that in this story, every time that I read about these um, tongues of fire um, that descended onto people, that was the Holy Spirit coming, I always get some weird images in my head of like what that could have looked like. So 
I'm curious what you guys are thinking. I'd love to see any drawings of what this might have looked like when the fire was descending on people. Or maybe you could make some flames out of paper or different materials you have around your house and maybe act out what it would have been like. Send in any videos or pictures about that and I'd love to include them on next, week children's, next week's Children's Church episode. Why don't I pray for us before we leave today? God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to learn about Pentecost. I thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And I pray that you would help us to be more like you, that we would listen to your Spirit and not ignore it, and that you would change us so that we could be better representatives and better followers of you, and that you would give us the courage to share this good news with any and everybody who we know. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I really do miss you guys, and I really do enjoy um, seeing your pictures and videos and seeing you guys at different Sunday school classes, um, but I can't wait till we can meet together in person. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you and your families are healthy, and know that for those of you that I know that are going through some tough times right now that might have family members that are sick, I am definitely praying for you and hope that God would heal um, your families and all those different things. I love you guys, and I will see you again next week.